Frequently when I'm doing more fine detail, like chasing, chiseling, trying to create interesting things on a piece of material, I do it under the treadle hammer, and I often do it with handheld tools. And I have a stop on the treadle hammer so I don't squish my fingers if the tool kicks out or something, so it's safe to work by hand that way. And I have this tool roll here that is just full of those types of tools. And there are all sorts of things in here. There are teardrop shaped tools, there are chisels, there are little swedges in here, there are butcher tools, and lots of stuff, but these are relatively short. And if you're trying to work by hand at the anvil, I think these are a little bit too short. You can use them for lighter stuff that doesn't radiate a lot of heat. But if you're working on a bigger piece of hot material, I like bigger, heavier tools for that. Certainly that's up to you and how you work. You can hold these in a pair of tongs and they work pretty well that way. But I think you get more control when you can just really get in there careful and control them by just rolling your fingers a little bit and you get better results that way. These are about five inches long. I'd rather have a tool that's more like nine to 10 inches long at the anvil, something like this. And we've looked at making a bunch of figure carving tools like this. But the tools I wanna to make today are not as dedicated to just figure carving. These are going to be teardrop shaped tools that you use for creating details. They can make really nice floral details. And we make these in a left, a right, and a center version. And they end up looking something like this. Hopefully you can see that. But that way, depending on what you're trying to create, you've got a matching set here. You try to make all three of them the same, except the lefts and the rights are curved. Typically, I like to make these out of S7. S7 is a shock-resisting steel. It's air-hardening. It's a little bit hard to work with by hand, but these tools, the forging part is really very simple, and there's a little bit of grinding, depending on how close you get by forging. So it's not too hard to make these tools out of S7. And I think all the tools in this tool roll are made out of S7. It's half, five-eighths. There's probably a few of them that are three-quarters because they're a little bit bigger. But I understand not everybody has S7, so use whatever steel you like. The better the steel, the longer the tool will last, the less often you're going to have to dress it and clean it up. But making these out of something like W1, 01, 4140, those are all viable options. And today, I don't have enough S7 on hand to make these tools. I actually ordered a piece last night. The rest of my order showed up today, but the S7 must be coming from a different warehouse, and it's not going to be here till tomorrow, but I wanted to get the video done today. So today I'm going to do what a lot of you would do, and I'm going to use a piece of coil spring. Now this is about three quarter inch diameter coil spring. If I cut off a couple of coils, there should be plenty to make three tools. We'll get a left, a right, and a center out of this. And coil spring is really pretty good material for this. It's good, tough stuff. It'll last a long time. The only reason I discourage the use of salvaged spring steel like this is because this spring was removed from service on whatever vehicle it was for a reason. And that reason is likely to be fatigue. It probably cracked somewhere or simply didn't behave like it should. And that fatigue could result in a broken tool. So there is some risk that you're wasting your time trying to make a tool out of used spring steel because it might break before you're done. Might break in use and that could be a little bit dangerous. So when you're using tools made out of stuff like this, really, really make sure you're wearing your eye protection. But my guess is there are more blacksmiths making this kind of tool out of coil spring and having good success with it, not having any problems. They've been doing it for years. It's not a bad choice. Just be aware that there might be a downside to it. So we're going to make these tools out of coil spring. First thing we need to do is cut some off and straighten it. Now, typically I would not cut this with a diamond blade. I would go to an abrasive blade to cut this. But since Graf sent that blade to test a while back. I have not tried it to see if it'll do this. It might do it just fine. I suspect it'll wear it out a lot faster. But just in the interest of seeing whether or not it will cut this, I'm going to go ahead and try it. And if I ruin the blade, I'll let you know. Don't do that. Well, it seemed to do that pretty well. I'll just use that blade a few more times in the next few days and see how it behaved, but I couldn't tell that it was cutting any slower at the end than it was at the beginning. 
When you do that, make sure you don't nick the other side of your cut here. I've got just a little bit of a scratch there, but it's not nicked. If you do that, you need to deal with that because that's going to be a place it'll break. You'll need to make your tools on either side of it and use that as the place where you cut your tools apart. But I think this should be enough for all three tools. Now, a lot of people like to just uncoil a whole spring at one time by putting it around something and unrolling it. I can't get this in my forge to do that. So I just do it this way. It takes a little bit of fiddling until you get it started. And this is still tough stuff. But once I get something started and can get it down here in the hardy hole, or the pritchel hole, it's pretty easy to unroll. Part of the problem I have right now is I can't get this coil in the forge, so therefore I can't get the whole thing in the forge. So until I can do that, sooner or later, if we start getting it to unroll, that'll probably fit in the forge a lot better than it has been. Plus this flattens it out somewhat. Not as dramatic as doing a whole thing at once, but I think it's easier to store that spring coiled up than it is to straighten it out in one big massive piece. I just need this straight enough that I can measure it and cut some pieces appropriate lengths. I'm going to straighten the whole thing and measure it and either cut it in three equal pieces or four equal pieces, I think. We'll see when we get an exact measurement. I'm just going to let that air cool, lay it out, and figure out how much I need for each tool, and then we will proceed. Well, this is cool enough I can get a tape measure close to it, but not cool enough to touch. Right now I am at 31 inches, or 780 millimeters. So I could cut that in three pieces, and they'd be a little over 10 inches long, which is the top end of what I would want a tool like this. But by the time I forge it, it's a little bit too long. And I think if I try to cut some of these at 8 inches, by the time I forge it, they'll be about 9 inches, and that's about the bottom of what I would want. So I think I'm going to go with that. I'll get a fourth piece of material that's a little short, but we'll do something with it in the future. And I'll just put a nick in these at those spots with the hardy. Still plenty tough stuff, but I can get a, a spot I can find again. That's also why I make my hardy out of hardened tool steel and not mild steel, because it will survive this. So I'm going to heat it up, I'm going to cut each one of these off, set the short one aside for a future project, and get back to work. I just got to find that little nick again. Remember, don't drive your hammer down on your hardy. Lighten up before you get all the way through and then break the piece off if you can.
I'm just going to take a little bit and grind that rough cut off so I've got nice smooth steel where I'm going to be forging the end of the tools. That gives me three matching pieces. I'm going to bring all of these up to heat and kind of work them all at the same time going one to the other for the same step. First thing we need to do is just kind of draw out the end so I've got a profile that I can make that teardrop out of. Actually, I think I will start these by tapering the struck end a little bit. This just pulls the length out some, concentrates your blows in use at the center of the tool, and I think just makes a more refined look to the tool. Absolutely not required, just my preference. I forge that to kind of a tapered octagon there. And I want to straighten out the rest of the tool. Because straight tools do perform much better. Now this end will do the, the working end. I'm going to do that same thing to all three pieces. With that done, I just want to draw out a nice taper here. I'm going to make it parallel with one of these flats, just because it makes sense. I think I just want a two-sided taper. Kind of like a thick chisel, but I'm going to leave it three-quarters wide. You can make these tools in lots of different sizes, and in fact, if you like tools like this, you will want them in numerous sizes. I'm trying to get that all centered. And I'm leaving that fairly thick. Because remember, this is not a chisel. It's going to be a tool that leaves an imprint. I need to leave plenty of material there to do that. So again, do that to all three pieces. Because these are a teardrop, they need to taper to one side or the other. Doesn't matter which side, they'll be balanced at this stage. So just pick a side. If you're worried about hitting your hammer on the edge of the anvil, come over to an edge somewhere and then your hammer can overhang the edge of the anvil. That's really all we need to do there. And again, you guessed it. Do the same thing to all three of them. Now I'm going to go ahead and touch mark these at this point. Really helps if you got a bottom swedge to put it in either at the anvil or here at the treadle hammer. And the other thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to stamp the steel type in here. Or what I believe the steel type to be.
And I'm going to make the assumption that this is 5160 or something close enough to 5160 that I can go ahead and treat it that way. Most automotive springs used to be 5160. I think most new ones are something slightly different, but a lot of them seem to still behave at like 5160 when you heat treat them. They're close enough that you can get away with that. But I do encourage you to do some test hardening and tempering before you just assume that that is correct. And I have used this same piece of coil spring for other things in the past. And I know that if I treat it like 5160, I get good results. So that's what I'm gonna stamp on there. Probably isn't exactly the right number, but it's close enough for my purposes here in the shop. I'm gonna go ahead and let all of these things slow cool in the forge. I'm gonna let them normalize, go have lunch, come back. They should be cool enough to touch then. And then we'll get on to grinding them. Well, these have now cooled enough to touch, and they are not all exactly the same, and I really didn't expect them to be perfectly the same. But they are close enough that I can grind them all to make them the same. And the first thing I'll do is I will grind them to length because they're not all exactly the same length. I'll do that, then I will grind this profile. Then I will worry about the actual shape of the working end of it. Now by letting these normalize, they're going to grind okay. If you're going to do this with a hand file, I would fully anneal these as best you can. And that's an advantage to the 5160 over the S7. It does normalize, whereas the S7 is air hardening steel. So if you let it cool in air, it's hardening, not normalizing. Let's grind these to length and let's see what we can do. I don't think I'm going to show grinding all three of these. They all look exactly the same at this stage. So we'll just take a quick look at the grinding and then I'll show you what I ended up with and then you can try to duplicate that as you grind your own tools. ground these so that the widths are the same and the lengths are the same. The next thing I will do is grind them so that it's all the same thickness and at the same degree of taper. They're actually pretty close. This looks like it's the smallest one so that'll be my guide and I'll make the other two match that. So again, I've got these all to pretty close to the same. I think in the long run, you can't expect them to be absolutely perfect, but you can keep going and really measure close if you're worried about that. But you want them pretty close. You want them to be a matched set. And the next thing to do is to start rounding the corners up. There's, these are teardrops. They don't want sharp corners, so all four of these corners need to be rounded. And then I want to round the end. These don't make a flat bottom depression, they make a curved depression usually. That's really all of the rough grinding done. The only thing I want to do now though is make sure that it's smooth so that I don't have any sharp grind lines. The tool is more corrosion resistant and less likely to develop stress cracks during hardening and tempering if it's taken down to a much finer finish. So I'm going to take these all down to a 220 finish. It looks just exactly like what we just did. So as soon as I'm done with that, we'll be right back.
Now for the straight teardrop, we're all done. That's ready to harden and temper. I'm not going to do anything else to it. So I can set one of these aside. If they aren't all identical, you need to pick which one to leave as the straight and which two make the best pair of curved ones. These are close enough to the same size. I'm not sure I care that much. But now these, we need one right and one left. So I'm going to heat these up. We're going to use a bottom swedge and a top fuller under the treadle hammer. And I'm going to just put a curve in here. How much curve is really up to you. And you may want similar sized sets with different degrees of curve. You may want different size set with the same degree of curve, some of both. In the long run, if you like these tools and you like the way they work, you might want a dozen or more sets of three just so you have some that do everything you want them to do. Now remember we want a right and a left on these so I'm going to take note that my skinny end is on this side and the next one I will do the other way. And I'm just going to swedge that down in there. Again the degree of curve is up to what you want for your tool. And a variety comes in awfully handy. I think I'm going to have to get that hot again. It's cooling off pretty quick. But you can see what we're starting with here. So while I wait for the other one, I'll do this one. I've got the skinny end on the opposite side this time. What you don't want to do is mess up the edge, you spend all that time grinding. But luckily this surface the fuller sits on will never contact hot work. So it's not a big deal if you ding it up just a little bit. I think I kind of like that curve. I think I'm just going to leave it there. This one could use just a little bit more. I think that's probably okay. So I'm happy that these two curves match and I've got one that does indeed go right and one that goes left. And I'm just going to let these air cool and normalize again. Since they've been forged just a little bit more I want to make sure they're de-stressed. But because this one hasn't seen any more forging I'm going to go ahead and bring it up to heat and we're going to harden and temper it. So to start this I just want to bring it up to heat slowly. The forge is hot right now it's not up to a full heat. But I'm just going to set it in there, let that sit at that temperature and let it come up maybe to a thousand degrees or something, however hot it is in there, over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Then I'll turn the forge up and bring it up to a nice cherry red. This has been in there for a while so it's as hot as it's going to get without running the burner. So I'm going to go ahead and heat it up. I really only need to get the last few inches fully up to temperature. I'm not going to worry about hardening the struck in. I don't think it really needs it. I think it'll hold up fine if it's in its normalized state. I've turned my gas pressure down to the absolute minimum that this forge will run at, which is about 6 PSI. It's getting very close to what I want. When I quench this, I'm just going to quench the last inch of it. Move it around in there in a figure eight so it hardens evenly. Better to do this with better ventilation. That's why I have my heat treat oven next to the door. I can open the door. Now for tempering, I'm just going to take the flap disc here. And I should be able to watch my temper colors run. I don't know if you can see it well enough in the, this light or not. But I'm blue here, peacock, 
bronze on straw down to the tip. I'm going to wait till I get kind of a bronze color down at the tip. This doesn't need to be tempered particularly hard, so letting it go a little further doesn't hurt. At that point I want to completely cool the tool so it's not continuing to temper down into the tip and make it any softer. So while I'm waiting for those other two curved tools to finish normalizing so I can harden and temper them, let's go ahead and finish the end of this. Just a real light touch on maybe a 400 grit belt, a little bit of polishing, and that's really all it needs. This doesn't need a lot to be a good working tool, but you do want a nice clean surface for your imprint. So there we have a set of three teardrop tools, a center version, a right-hand version, a left-hand version, whichever one you want to call right and left, I guess it depends on which way you turn them. But in any case, there's one that goes one way, one that goes the other way. These are often used in sets of three so that you have all three of those stamped side by side. It's a little kind of a floral or fleur-de-lis type pattern. But sometimes you'll need them just one to do a specific detail because of the way your piece looks. And what you use these for, that's really up to you. Use your imagination. Everybody's going to have a different idea on what these should be used for and how to use them. Now we'll look at some things using these in upcoming videos. We'll at least do a fairly simple leaf that uses these as the veining tools. And it's a whole different look and a much classier look than just using a chisel to create the veins on a leaf. And of course, if you want to see close-ups of these that show a little bit more detail, stay tuned to the very end of the video. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around and watch a few of the other videos. If you're staying in and you're practicing good social distancing technique, there are lots of videos on YouTube, not just mine, but lots of other blacksmithing creators, other creators. It's a great way to kill some time if you can't go out and do some of the things you would otherwise like to do. I truly hope that each and every one of you can stay healthy and that you can get through these trying times that we're facing for the next couple of months without too much difficulty. But I will be here making videos, and I hope you can get out to your shop. I hope you can make something. But do stay safe, do wear your safety glasses, and we will see you for the next one.